Welcome back to another episode of Tank Talks. On this week's episode, we skip the interview and go right to the weekly rundown show with John Ruffalo. Welcome back to the Tank, John. How you been? Great, Matt. How are you? Oh, pretty good. We got some soap opera drama happening in the Canadian venture capital world here. We had an interesting post coming out from the former chair of the CBCA and current managing partner of Lumira Ventures, Peter Vandervelden, publicly criticizing the CBCA CEO, without naming names, Kim Furlong, for her handling of a recent meeting in the International Limited Partners space in London. It was a LinkedIn post on September 20th, and basically Peter was calling out a failed attempt to promote Canadian venture capital industry to foreign investors, and basically claimed that Kim did not prepare or highlight the growth and success stories within the Canadian VC market. Obviously, this meeting was organized by the Global Affairs Canada and hosted by former MP Ralph Goodall at the Canada House. And this was a, a, an event basically bringing in international and foreign investors to engage with the Canadian VC industry and talk about co-investing alongside Canadian companies. And Peter basically emphasized that this was a missed opportunity to attract foreign capital and felt that the CBCA's leadership should have done a better job. You know, what are your thoughts on sort of this sort of uh, criticism being publicly shared and maybe in a different format than we typically see? Uh, do you think this might bring about some change in the way that membership organizations listen to their constituents and also vice versa on the other side and how they relay the message that the constituents want on a global stage? Yeah, I mean, I, Matt, I, I read it as well, too. I guess I would start off by saying we only see one side of the discussion, right? So it's not exactly being chastised without understanding the full facts. It's very hard to make a, any sort of a judgment on the merits of what's been criticized. So I, I'm not going to wait in there because I don't know what really, what, what happened. I only read what you had read. Criticism by the members of organizations is absolutely essential and welcome. And frankly, if the organization is not actively soliciting it, then they deserve to get vilified when when things go askew. I would also say, I, I don't know all the channels that the CVCA does have to, to uh, solicit comments and feedback. But you know, one of the adages that I, I, I try to go through is chastise privately and praise publicly. So what I don't know is if Peter did communicate that and if he was strong armed, then maybe they deserve that. But if they didn't even have a chance on it, it is a little unfair and it's, you know, learning lessons. But I'll tell you one thing, you know what it does do? Out there, it does make it looked like that the venture capital community is completely unaligned, uncoordinated, fighting, et cetera. It doesn't exactly give a good look for cohesion either to be, to be blunt. No, it's, it's good. It's good thoughts, John. I think, you know, the question I had is how important do you think industry associations, associations are really in shaping the narrative and the success of Canada's venture capital ecosystem? And maybe what steps do you think organizations like the CVCA can take to better promote the Canadian VC firms and encourage kind of stronger investment domestically or internationally. Two comments on that, since uh, I am the co-founder of the of the Council of Canadian Innovators. Ours is all about the members. Whenever we at, were asked for an opinion, you know, my first reaction is, what do the members think? Right, Because you have to be the reflection of the members. So if the CVCA is not doing that, they better get on their horse and do that. As it relates, you know, as an investor, as it relates to fundraising, quite honestly, I don't rely on a member organization to do it for me. I do it for myself because you can do a little bit of the advertising, but as you know, Matt, that's not how you raise money. You raise it based on trust and personal relationship. I don't see how this is an effective channel for that, unless it's just kind of introducing you to the market so that you can go out afterwards. So take that responsibility in your own hands. And I, I, I frankly never even use that as a, as a channel for my own fundraising strategies. 
No, it's a good point. I agree with you. I don't think anyone should rely on membership organizations to help them on the fundraising, but maybe as a thought leadership, as a, uh, a voice or an entry into the ecosystem is something that people maybe look to these associations for. But, you know, speaking about pension funds and domestic investment, Brookfield was in talks with Canadian pensions to create a new $50 billion fund for domestic assets, uh, deemed the Maple Fund, you know, seeking $36 billion from pensions, as well as $10 billion from the federal government sources are saying. And this is obviously something that the Toronto-based investment giant Brookfield has thought about probably for quite some time, but has now got their hands in the cookie jar, it seems like, with some of the largest investors in the country. You know, what are your thoughts around this? You know, Brookfield would be the administrator of the fund and getting also funds from Ottawa at a time where we all know what's happening in Ottawa is not very functional. Uh, Brookfield itself says it will contribute $4 billion from sources uh, as well, not willing to be named, obviously, given the sensitivity of the discussions. But what are your thoughts here? Again, I, I'm, I'm not privy to any discussions on this, but based on what I'm reading, it's it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. I think there was a bit of a concern as well, too, is that you have Mark Carney, who's involved in the uh, economic platform and in finance of the Liberal Party. He's part of Brookfield. That that the optics of that didn't look very good. And that wasn't timed at all. It was coincidental, but the optics are the optics. You know, a couple of general comments. I still do not believe that pension funds uh, should not be fulfilling any political or any duty other than maximizing the, the returns for its members. Period. End of story. Now, it doesn't mean that the government should absolve itself with public policy to make the Canadian companies much more enticing from an investment perspective. It always feels like the government is trying to find, you know, the evil characters that are, that are behaving badly. Having said all that, the pension fund leaders should be very cognizant that there are a creature of public policy. And if you poo poo Canada Just remember, there is lots of things that can be done to make your lives far more difficult. I would not force anything, but I would influence to say, folks, please be sure to look in your own backyard. And if you don't want to go in directly, as opposed to setting up one big massive fund, which really creates one massive gatekeeper, pension funds go out there and act as an LP to a variety of funds in Canada. So we have a several different organizations that are distributing Canada, uh, capital through the Canadian ecosystem. Yeah, I find it also like there's going to be this like selection bias in terms of the assets that they're going to even be able to contribute to if they got this off the ground. Being- it's all large scale, large scale assets and infrastructure like yeah. It's not what's going to take our country forward in the next 50 years. It's like the next five to 10 years. Yeah, it's 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 very difficult at that scale to, to deal with the innovation agenda. I, I completely agree. And I, I do think that if, uh, you know, when you hear the pension fund saying, well, you know, to do those smaller investments is very, very difficult. I agree. Cut a check to the LPs, to a variety of LPs, cut it to a fund of funds, let them do it. But it doesn't absolve your moral responsibility as a stronger Canada means you're going to have stronger membership as well. So there is a great flywheel here. Yeah. You know, switching gears to the innovation economy again here in Canada, we've got Lightspeed Commerce back in the news after Dax De Silva returned as CEO to focus on achieving profitable growth and re- reaching a billion in revenue. The company has now confirmed that it is conducting a strategic review of its business and operations and has enlisted JP Morgan Chase to evaluate options uh, where the stock surged uh, over 17%. You know, the company is now obviously in talks with potential buyers running through a process. You know, what do you think is going to happen here? Do you think it's uh, going to have a sale or go private? You know, obviously, it's probably not going to be on the public markets for much longer. We're seeing this trend happening in the Canadian tech companies for the last year or so. And what do you think this means for investors? What did you and I say, Jesus, well over a year ago? There is going to be the big privatization of Canadian public companies. We said it. We said it very, very early. We said it before, frankly, anyone thought that was going to happen. This is 
one of the biggest ones in Canada is going to, that's going to do this. You know, what Dax had said publicly was, you know, after he came back in because growth had slowed, but costs were not disciplined, he dealt with the cost side of the equation, but it didn't do anything with the stock price. So they, a company of this size, is really getting orphaned in the Canadian public markets. You know, if they're having difficulty reigniting their growth, sounds like the other option is just to go private, find a strategic buyer or a financial buyer, and perhaps do some of the very, very difficult things that you might not be able to do from a public perspective. But yeah, it's disappointing. Yeah. It's so interesting. You know, a lot of people are saying the same thing where it's like, we need to get more companies public. There's been less IPOs in the last few years than there were in the total depths of the global financial crisis. You know, Thomas LaFont was speaking at the uh, All In podcast about this and saying, just get public, you know, get fit and get out there. But then we see companies that have been public, that have been totally destroyed, removing 80% or more of their market cap. And now they're trying just at the you know precipice of getting profitable or having positive EBITDA and growing revenue, but there's no way they can maintain being public because there's just too much scrutiny over them. And so now they're going private. So almost like a lose-lose for some of these companies, it feels like. Yeah. You didn't even, yeah, you didn't mention Canaxis. Right. They're under similar pressure as well too. Here's one of the excellent companies and they're having the uh, similar difficulty. So, you know, that is getting rather concerning that it is going public a truly, you know, an option uh, anymore for some of these companies. A hundred percent agree. Well, let's move down to south of the border. I just got back from the U.S. and from the West Coast. I was taking my first Waymo, my first self-driving car experience. And holy shit, was it cool, John. I mean, this was... One of those moments I will never forget. Uh, basically, you push a button. This thing shows up with the spinning cameras and the LiDAR systems. It pulls up right in front of you. You pull out your phone to unlock it, and you get into the back seat, and there's no one in the driver's seat. It was unbelievable. These got Jaguar electric vehicles, so they've got unlimited torque. They take off, and they just rip around. And I was riding it at nighttime, too, which is a little scary, I have to say. Now, here's the thing that I think. There are comments around there that says this could surpass Uber in terms of its dominance in the taxi industry. So right now, just for our listeners, the Waymo, which was uh, spun out of Alphabet's self-driving car unit, is uh, alive in Phoenix, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. It's doing over 100,000 rides, paid rides per week. Analysts are estimating that Waymo's valuation could be around $110 billion, basically comparing it to Uber's ride-hailing business. There's huge upfront costs, obviously, for the cars, the LiDAR systems, and the vehicles. But their profit margins could surpass Uber's because of the absence of the driver. And I'll tell you, the experience without the driver was way better. No one talking on their phone, no dirty cars, nobody, you know, uh, texting and driving, potentially under the influence or whatever. It was amazing for us to sit in the car and not have anyone in the front driver's seat. So what are your thoughts on this? Do you think this could be the time where Waymo or even Tesla taxi, when it comes out, robo taxis, will take down the 800 pound taxi king Uber finally? This was not really a technology issue. A lot of the tech, I mean, the technology is improving for sure, but it was a while ago where the technology surpassed human error on on their driving. The real issue was on the regulatory insurance, et cetera, and, you know, in market uh, acceptance. I had a chat with uh raquel ertizan on the the truck driving similarity and i asked her the same question and she said she surprised me by the number of favorable regulatory acceptance in many of the u.s cities i think the estimates way back when was about 2030 it's feeling like we may even get before that i don't think these are overnight things Because at the end of the day, when you start having robots interacting with human drivers and there's issues, how do you deal with tort and responsibility uh, and all of that sort of stuff? It will get all solved, but but wow, that's uh, pretty exciting. I haven't done that yet. And frankly, being in a wheelchair, I'm not, you know, I can't wait for the first wheelchair based uh, <laughs> uh waymo but uh it that it, it, it sounds uh, fascinating 
It will create a lot of freedom, I think, for a lot of people who need a, a special handicap, you know, assistance as and well. And safety, and safety, safety issues. You don't worry about uh, who the driver might be late at night as well, too. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, the other thing too, I remember my first Uber uh, experience as well, and that felt pretty revolutionary. You just got the notification or the text message back. But the speed at which it picked up from that moment, because I'm nobody special, right? I'm just a regular citizen that gets access to technology like everyone else does. So this wasn't like a, a beta experience. Like when it starts coming into the common conversation, that's when it really picks up steam. And I think we're going to have a lot more people talking about this. The only funny thing is, you know, they usually say that by the time it crosses the chasm, it's when the taxi drivers are talking about it. Well, what happened to now? <laughs> the Uber. Yeah, the Uber drivers <laughs> are in the now ones on the other side of the seat. Now you know how it feels. Um, <laughs> speaking of regulation, you know, California's Governor Gavin Newsom uh, vetoed the bill uh, 1047. I was surprised. I know. So for our listeners who don't know what we're talking about, there was a groundbreaking AI safety bill that aimed to impose stricter regulations on AI companies in Silicon Valley. The proposed legislation was trying to require AI firms to conduct safety testing on their models, basically before public release and hold them liable for any severe harm that was caused, you know, with damages exceeding 500 million by their technologies. And this bill got a lot of support from notable figures, obviously like Elon Musk and AI pioneer Jeffrey Hinton and over 120 Hollywood actors and directors, but it faced a significant opposition from tech giants. So open AI, Google, as well as venture capitalists and politicians like Nancy Pelosi, obviously lobbied against it, arguing that the regulations would stifle the innovation. And Governor Newsom acknowledged the bill's good intentions, but labeled it as flawed and committing to work with AI experts to develop appropriate safeguards and future regulations. So given this veto, John, how do you think policymakers should balance the need for innovation in AI while given the necessary implementations for regulation to prevent harm? I'm not going to go through the merits of the actual legislation because there are pros and uh, in cons. But what surprised me is I here we have Ga- Gavin Newsom, who is one of the most virtual signaling politicians in the entire United States. And not only did he have, you know, the the classic virtue signalers of Hollywood behind him, but he had Jeffrey Hinton, Elon Musk. <laughs> and this is the whole big tech versus small tech discussion that Andreessen had talked about. And yet what surprised me is, yeah, 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 yeah. We want to be safe, you know, for the world. And all. Oh, well, wait a minute. Well, let's not get too hasty if this means that California is not going to be the centerpiece. And my God, you know, Where are the dollars of my packs going to come from, et cetera? So I got to watch out who I really piss off on here. It felt like a complete political bullshit, frankly. And it just goes to show how many, and again, I don't have a bone to pick with Gavin Newsom, but it is funny is that what do they really stand for when all of a sudden, they go one way and then they realize where their their bread's really buttered and then boom, the other way. And it's like, you know, guys, I have no idea what you really mean and what you really stand for. But you know what? Am I surprised? Really? No, not at all. But I was, I just was surprised on who was in his camp versus who wasn't. And it's completely contrary to the narrative that he's been spouting off for years. Yeah. I mean, just go on Twitter and see how many times Elon Musk ship post Gavin Newsom, but then obviously is on the same side of him for this bill. If, you know, if Elon agrees with me, it must be wrong. God, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, it didn't agree with him. It agreed with the bill, but not the with bill, him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, point. you know, they've got more regulations on the nuclear sector than they do have right now in AI, which is totally asinine. But, you know, sticking with the AI theme here, open AI back in the market, reportedly closing a new fund raising round, a significant increase in its last valuation, an astonishing $150 billion valuation. Reports that Apple was in talks, but now no longer participating, but they've secured investments with players like SoftBank for $500 million, Microsoft for a billion, and Thrive Capital for another billion. Rumors are that they're raising up to $6.5 million through convertible notes, with obviously Josh Kushner's fund, Thrive Capital, spearheading the fundraise you know, alongside Tiger Global and Co2. You know, it's really interesting. There's this uh, conversion to a for-profit that's happening. There's the turnover of all the senior leadership. There's rumors. I mean, 
this company cannot have a good week of just you know regular execution without a ton of things blowing up in the air at the same time. It's unbelievable, but the thing still delivers, right? You know, the capital that's coming in is just as big on the capital that they're getting from the uh, revenues they're generating, right? There's rest, uh, estimates that the company could uh, you know aim for a revenue of 11.6 billion in 2025, and they're already generating over four billion you know, run rate right now, closer to 6 billion by the end of the year. So they're still growing a hundred percent year over year. The capital they're getting in is obviously being used to develop incredible products like, oh, on preview, which I'm using all the time now. It's unbelievable. I guess the question for you, John, is, you know, with OpenAI's massive fundraising and the valuations, but shifting to a for-profit model, if Microsoft allows them, by the way, how do you think this will influence, you know, investment strategies and sort of the competitive dynamics in the AI space? And, you know, will these trickle on effects happen where, hey, open AI has got $150 billion valuation. All of us should get the same sort of innovation valuation as well. You and I have said, and again, for those who are listening, to be very specific, I do believe that we are in a hype investment bubble on Gen AI. It doesn't mean that Gen AI will not ultimately deliver the utility, but in the immediate term, the the returns do not seem to satisfy the amount of capital going in. Now, it was interesting. I was Matt, you you've you've come to the Upfront Summit in Los Angeles, and I was there in February, and Founders Fund was speaking about their investment in uh, in OpenAI. And he made a comment, which I thought was interesting. He said, we haven't made a single other investment in Gen AI because basically we think we're in a hype uh, investment bubble. We have no clue what's going to happen. So we've decided to say, let's declare the winner being open AI. It's good enough for us. And let's put all of our capital in that one. It seems like Thrive Capital is doing the same thing. So in answer to your question, I think they're agreeing that the long-term optimism is there where the short-term return might not be there, but they want to invest in the space. So bet all red on this one and let's see how it goes. What that means though is it's not a cascading effect through the ecosystem. It is a bet that basically there's going to be the rule of three in this space. And open AI, probably followed by Google or one or the two of them, are going to take two of those spots. And it's a jump ball for that third. And I think this is more of a reflection of that reality. I'll take a, a, another uh, view on this, John. I think we're in a certain period of time, a window of, let's say, two and a half years, where we're still getting the huge hype cycle of the um, OpenAI and ChatGPT's value, but it will be put into serious competition in the next year, 2025, where major software companies like Salesforce, Microsoft, Workday, and ServiceNow are already developing their AI agents that are capable of performing serious tasks for the enterprise. And OpenAI's having you know, their anticipated advanced agents coming out might not actually land on the enterprises as much as these ones like Salesforce. I was fortunate to see some uh, agent force for a friend of mine who works at Salesforce. It is unbelievable what it is doing and can do for the Salesforce ecosystem, pulling in Data Cloud and MuleSoft and you know Tableau and everything like that and Slack it will be a game changer. So I think there's this moment in time where OpenAI has just had greenfield opportunity to soak up all the dollars available to them. But going into 2025 and maybe the year after, it's going to be real competition for them to sustain itself. And they may only be an API company after that, where everyone else is going to be an API company as well. Yeah. I mean, Matt, I, I, and again, I was speaking specifically to the infrastructure layer. I think that's where the rule of three is going to apply. And you could argue on the next operating layer, but on the application layer, it's going to be who owns the customers. And I do agree with you that I don't see open AI being the winner uh, at the customer level, but I guess at the end of the day, if Salesforce is very effective, which LLM are they going to use? Are they going to use Anthropic because they're a big investor in it? 
or are others going to use open AI and go the Microsoft route? I, I, I don't know, but I do agree with you that that application layer is really ultimately, and it's, it, this has happened in several cycles, ultimately extracts the greatest economic rents. Yeah. First mover advantage has a real benefit, $150 billion benefit, apparently, but we'll see what happens in the next year or so. Till next time, John, thanks for jumping in the tank. All right. Thanks, Matt. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Tank Talks. We hope you found today's conversation as insightful as we did. If you're enjoying the show, we've got three quick things to ask of you. First, hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or YouTube. Next, follow us and stay up to date on upcoming episodes and behind-the-scenes content on social media with Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And lastly, share the love. If you found value in today's episode, share with a friend or colleague who'd benefit too. Your support helps us bring in more amazing guests and keeps the Tank Talks engine running. That's it for today. Until next time, keep disrupting and innovating.